by the Montana Television Network. This is the 10 o'clock news on Q2, Montana's news leader. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Janelle Slade. And I'm Jay Cohn. A Billings man avoids prison time for using marijuana before he caused a fatal crash back in 2016. The victim's family members emotional today as each asked the judge to impose a prison sentence. But instead, the judge sentenced 21-year-old Kent Jensen to five years with the Montana Department of Corrections. Now, that often means court-ordered treatment or some form of supervision. Jensen rolled through a stop sign, crashing into motorcyclist Joshua Fry. It happened at the intersection of Wise Lane and the Frontage Road. Today, the victim's family calls the sentencing an injustice. Kitu's Asia Gore was in the courtroom late today and joins us now with details. Asia. Jane Janelle, the family of Joshua Fry says today's sentencing is just the latest example of Montana judges slapping impaired drivers on the wrist. Kent Jensen said he's been regularly using marijuana since he was 13 and admitted he had used the drug before causing this fatal crash. At the scene, Jensen submitted to a blood test, which revealed a level of THC intoxication four times the standard allowed in Montana. But officers noted Jensen did not appear impaired at the time. Fry's family testified today Jensen made the decision to use marijuana before driving that day and say Fry was an innocent victim. Jensen apologized to the victim's family, saying he can't take his actions back. He can only accept what he did. Fry's mother tells me acceptance is not enough. Jensen should be spending time behind bars. I think that it just sets the precedence for the whole community that uh, no big deal. I'm going to have a slap on the wrist. And not that I wanted him to have to spend years in a, his life in prison, but I think there are consequences. I've known people who will go and shoot a dog who are thrown right in jail. And we're talking a dog versus a child, my son. And I just, I think this was very unjust. Fry's mother tells me she does agree with one part of the sentence. Jensen was ordered by the judge to speak to students at every Billings Middle School and High School about the dangers and consequences of driving while impaired. Jane Janelle. All right, thank you, Asia. A gun found inside a hardened high school classroom. And now a teacher is behind bars facing several felony charges and a 17-year-old student is suspended. Last Friday, the school's student resource officer received information that a student at the high school had a gun inside the building. No weapon was found, but the 17-year-old was escorted off the property. But then on Saturday, when deputies returned to the school, they did find a Glock 27 handgun inside a classroom. After further investigation, uh, art teacher Nora Block was arrested. The 42-year-old teacher now awaiting arraignment on charges of possessing a firearm on school property, felony tampering with evidence, and felony obstructing justice. Block apparently told school officials about her role in the incident on Monday. Hardin authorities have also issued an arrest warrant for the 17-year-old student. I've actually been uh, physically sick uh, since we found out about this incident. It's never fun to deal with these situations, but we learn from it. And we're happy that we have a partnership with the Bighorn County Sheriff Department. They have been excellent through this whole process. But, of course, it weighs on administrators, teachers, students, myself, and the entire community in general. Now, the student is suspended and will face an expulsion hearing. Block, meanwhile, is suspended as well and is currently in custody. Both Montana Senator Steve Daines and Congressman Greg Gianforte were aboard the Amtrak train that crashed into a garbage truck in Virginia this morning. The impact of the crash killing one person and seriously injuring two others. We got to speak with Senator Daines on the phone following the accident. He told us all of his fellow lawmakers were safe, but in all five people were transported to the hospital following that crash in rural Virginia. The lawmakers were en route to West Virginia to spend the next few days at a re resort for their annual issues conference. Daines tells us the trip turned tragic when he heard a loud bang and the train shook violently. Fine, and I don't think any passengers on the train were injured. Uh, it was quite a jolt. Some people were thrown to the ground, but uh, nobody was injured. I'm not sure why that garbage truck was crossing the track. It looks like a crossing that has arms on it that it dropped. I'm sure they'll be investigating what happened, but uh, very, very sad. The reporter looks like the driver or one of the passengers in that vehicle uh, was killed in the accident. Representative Greg Gianforte and his wife were working on their laptops. Now, he spoke to Q2 over the phone after the incident as well. He said, quote, we felt a lurch and a quick halt to the train. 
We are doing okay. No serious injury. We are concerned about the other accident victims. And we also heard from Wyoming's lawmakers. They were not on the train involved in the accident. Billings police are looking for help in tracking down whoever painted graffiti on schools and cars last week. Police say it happened between 9 p.m. Tuesday night, January 23rd, and 8.30 a.m. on Wednesday, January 24th. That graffiti targeting Lewis and Clark Middle School, Billings Senior High, and several vehicles in the 10 block of Burlington Avenue. The offensive graffiti, including swastikas, profanity, and images of male genitalia. Take a look. Police are looking for help finding this man picked up on Home Depot surveillance video. He may be a witness with information regarding the incident. If you know the identity of this man, police are asking that you call or text school resource officer. You see the number on your screen, 670-2757. On to the weather scene. Bob McGuire, perhaps a hint of things to come tonight here in Billings. Yeah. We had periods of heavy snow and the temperatures dropping. And the light snow in the Billings area right now and streets are very slick because of yes. that. But we started getting snow yesterday and this morning. And let me show you who the big winners are so far. Uh, Story, Wyoming had five and a half inches of snow. Burgess Junction, Wyoming, McLeod, Red Lodge Mountain, 14 miles west of Nye, all with five inches of snow. Now, our short range forecast for uh, snowfall shows it's not going to be very much here in the Billings area. Uh, by the time, say, um, a noon Saturday, we're looking at maybe about 72 hundredths of an inch, about three quarters of an inch. But then later on Saturday, another several waves of moisture start moving in, and we're expecting to see some very heavy snow move in by Saturday and Sunday, maybe up to 10 inches. You know? All right, thanks so much, Bob. State emergency managers now say they will appeal the federal government's decision to deny millions of dollars in fire aid. Leaders initially said they would not ask FEMA to reconsider its ruling that Montana's fire season did not meet the requirements for a major disaster declaration. Well, the state will instead narrow its request and focus on 20 days in September when weather conditions were most severe and hundreds of new fires started up. Now, the updated request also drops to about $15 million versus the original $44 million requested. More than $600,000 in fire relief grant money will now help more than 81 organizations across the state. Started in September, that fund, created by the Montana Television Network, merged with the Montana Community Foundation and then grew through extraordinary generosity from across the state and country. MTN and our parent company, Cordillera Communications, matched the first $50,000 in donations. The money will help purchase personnel, equipment, radios, and other fire and safety gear. Now, a few of the departments to receive grants in our region include Broadview Fire, Joliet Fire, Lockwood Fire, Red Lodge Fire, and Shepherd Fire. A full list can be found on our website at ktvq.com. It's an uncertain time in Coal Strip, Montana these days. Change is on the horizon as the shutdown date for coal strip power plants one and two inches closer. Last year, Puget Sound Energy, which owns half of units one and two, announced that June of 2022 is the date that the two oldest of the coal strip plants will close. Tonight, we're on the road to coal strip to see how that community is planning for the unknown. Coal strip is a throwback to the old company towns of Montana's past that sprouted up seemingly overnight. Coal Strip Power Complex, built in the 1970s, then expanded in the 80s, sits right in the heart of the community, a community that today boasts a population of 2,316 people. Coal is king here and will be for the foreseeable future. But in spite of the pending shutdown of Units 1 and 2 within four years, State Senator Dwayne Ankney is not convinced. I ain't so damn sure 1 and 2 is going to close in four years. You know, I think there's people out there, there's money if there's money to be made and if there's a demand for your product you're going to do everything you can to keep that demand satisfied and make some money on it the veteran montana lawmaker believes in the end market conditions will dictate what happens here but if and when coal strip units one and two close their absence will be felt across the state when one and two close uh, you're looking at about a 20 25 million head a year to the state, county, and city. Rosebud County Commissioner Doug Martins says planning ahead is nearly impossible. Things are so up in the air right now that it's, it's really kind of hard to, to make a plan. Rosebud County is the fourth largest in Montana, and life without units one and two will admittedly be a struggle. Between the power plants, all four power plants and the mine, they pay roughly 85% of the taxes that we spend in Rosebud County. 
we've kind of had this cloud hanging over us for quite a while and and what they you know they've kind of gotten used to it i think and they're kind of you know for the most part embracing it a little bit and understanding what's you know it's going to happen one and two are coming down their concerns are are jobs you know that's the that's the big thing is jobs and and uh, where do we go from here Union leader Stacy Yates with the IBEW hopes new coal technology such as carbon capture could pave the way for a bright future in coal strip. Carbon capture, that's one idea that's been flown out there. I, I don't know anything about it, what it would take or, or what it entails, but I'd sure like to see that. That would definitely boost our jobs, boost our economy here in coal strip. In fact, the older two plants now in the running to be the focal point of a feasibility study on carbon sequestration. What are we going to do with the closure of Units 1 and 2? And just this week, Coal Strip community leaders sat down with the governor and the attorney general to begin discussions on how to spend $10 million in community transition funds, money set aside by Puget Sound Energy to help begin the transition away from coal. And we invite you back tomorrow night. We'll be heading back to Coal Strip to see how that town is fighting back while still embracing its uncertain future. Janelle? All right. Thanks so much, Jay. Coming up on tonight's 10 o'clock news, Arby's may have the meats, and some of that is thanks to Montana. Find out how. Plus, a family and its property has been with Montana Special Olympics since the early days. and in